One of the greatest and most harmful disasters that historical heritage currently suffers from is archaeological plunder, motivated by greed, ignorance, or egocentrism. Furtive excavations are still, despite the current legislation and the tireless police activity, an endemic disease that damages irreversibly with the integrity of the archaeological sites. Unfortunately, the history of Thea Bieha has been closely linked to this type of illegal activity. Indeed, in December 1984, allegedly in order to obtain arid soil, an excavation machine began to remove soil from the site known as Thea Bieha. Several locals from El Ajido decided to locate Morhi, went to the site, and after reviewing the surface materials and the visible structures, they made a hole of approximately one square meter in which appeared a section of a mosaic. This act prompted an archaeological action of urgency by the cultural delegation that confirmed the archaeological value of the site and, in turn, promoted the inclusion of Thea Bieha as a cultural interest site, the legal figure that offers the maximum protection to heritage in Spain. Surely this was not the first furtive episode that the site suffered, but unfortunately, and despite its new legal consideration, it has not been the last. Our archaeological intervention has allowed us to document some holes that must belong to past furtive activities. In addition, the shortage of metals at the top soils, in contrast with its abundance at the deeper levels, is a clear testimony of the performance of these illegal activities, especially with metal detectors. As if that were not enough, already in the 21st century, there was a new looting with a bulldozer on the site that severely damaged several structures of the Roman and pre-Roman cities. Thanks to the recovered contemporary materials and the study of the satellite images, we have been able to establish with great precision the date on which the irreversible crime against this El Ejido heritage was committed. This new illegal action has led the city council to install cameras for uninterrupted control of the site in order to prevent such an incident from happening again in the future. Beyond the detective skills that have allowed us to establish the intensity, chronology, and objectives of the furtive activities, the truth is that after each unregulated archaeological action, we lose a piece of our history. The thieves and amateur archaeologists do not have the tools or the necessary training and we lose much information along the way. Each archaeological artifact, whether it is pottery, metal, glass, or stone, even if it is on the surface, collected without the appropriate documentation, is a modification of the information of the archaeological site that will make our work more difficult. Of course, the more active and intense the furtive activity is, the greater the damage. So, for example, if the object has been obtained after digging a hole, this action has altered the stratigraphy permanently. If, in addition, some other structure or object has been broken in the process, archaeologists will find themselves in a damaged context from which we will be able to obtain much less information. It is also a process that we are unable to reverse, and the information that we obtain through our work is the only way to know how life was developed in the past. Finally, we must not forget that archaeological objects are not private property, but belong to all of us. Each recovered artifact, once its study is completed, is placed in the corresponding museums where, potentially, you will be able to see it in the future, being participants in our discoveries. Returning to the first archaeological intervention in Thea Bieha, in addition to an interesting occupation since prehistory, a Bacchic or Dionysian mosaic was located, from the preserved dimensions of 4. 45 meters wide by 4.60 meters long, and assuming the symmetry of the decoration and some evidence from the mosaic itself, we can establish that the original mosaic reached 9.5 meters in length. Due to its decorative motifs and the size of the tessery, its chronology must be located between the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. Although it has mainly constructive techniques and decorative resources from the 1st century AD, such as the reduced size of the tiles, the predominance of black and white tessery, and the vegetal and geometric motifs that frame the scene, it also incorporates some elements from the following century, such as a greater variety in color or the representation of animals. We think, therefore, that it was made completely in the 2nd century AD, at some point in which the new Italian trends and techniques had not yet been fully imposed in Morhi. 
The mosaic is headed by a vegetal scene followed by several frames made up of braided ropes and other geometric motifs. The scene refers to one of the most important topics in Dionysian or Bacchic mythology, the creation of wine. At the end of the scene, we can see a female figure covered with a veil or a hood, which would be represented in eight slightly different shapes, which leads us to associate it with the Titan Selene, the moon. The rest of the panels, whether they are circular or of other geometric shapes, represent important elements for the narration of the episode. In the octagons we can see an Enoco, a jug to take the wine out of the craters and serve it in the glasses. Precisely, another of the octagons is occupied by a crater from which a vegetal element sprouts. Finally, we have the representation of a human figure, which, both for parallels and for being the bearer of the cluster of the grape and the crook, must be directly related to Bacchus or Dionysus. The smaller circles correspond, in the first place, with the beheaded head of Ampelus, the lover of Dionysus, from whose corpse would sprout the wine according to the Bacchic myth. We also find a partridge carrying an elm leaf, and as opposed to it, we find a dove carrying an olive branch. Finally, we have the representation of a satyr with a serious face, suitable for the tragic tone of the story. In the last circular emblem, the one with greater preserved dimensions, a panther appears under a cluster of grapes. These are typical animals of Dionysus, used on many occasions to highlight the special origin of the god, but which in this case may have been represented by the fact that it played a prominent role in the love story between Ampelus and Bacchus.